Hi, I'm Kelly DiMartino with the City of Fort Collins. We're having a conversation with the community about how the city should address its pressing needs in four primary areas, police, fire, street maintenance, and parks and recreation. Today we're going to be talking about parks and recreation specifically, and I'm pleased to have three guests joining me. First of all, Diane Jones, our Deputy City Manager. Diane, thanks for being here. My pleasure, Kelly. Thank you. Marty Heffernan, who is the Director of Culture, Parks, Recreation, and the Environment. Right. Marty, thanks yeah. for being here. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. And Leanne Hayes, who is one of our Parks Crew Chiefs. Leanne, welcome. Thank you. So, again, this conversation with the community is really about looking forward and thinking about what we want our community to look like. Parks and Recreation is one of those areas um, where we've seen some significant changes over the past several years in our budget um, and in the services that we're able to deliver. And so, um, Marty, I'm going to ask you maybe if you'd start out by just giving us a little bit of context of since 2005, kind of what's different today versus 2005 in terms of, of the budget for Parks and Recreation. Sure, Kelly. I think as most everyone knows, the city's financial circumstances have been pretty difficult since 2005. And um, the parks budget actually has been reduced by $440,000 over that period of time. And uh, at the same time, the park system, the trail system, continues to grow. So we have more to take care of and actually less dollars to do it with. And then on the recreation side, um, it's a little more difficult. We've got um, $1.1 $1 million in reductions. And we have reserves to um, help us address that situation. But, um, you know, basically it's pretty difficult. So we haven't had to make cuts there, but we have pretty significant um, use of reserves and uh, those reserves will actually be running out pretty soon. Diane, you know from your from your role mm -hmm. you're looking across the organization at all of these different um, different needs. Right. Talk a little bit about the scope of what's happening in Parks and Recreation um, and how it fits in with that bigger picture. Well, um, Parks and Recreation um, is a significant part of our service and uh, it's one of those uh, or a couple of those services um, that people really uh, use uh, throughout the community. It's one of those quality of life elements that people really enjoy about our community, uh, whether it's use of the parks in terms of sporting events, it might be for people do a lot of walking in our parks. Um, our recreation program is um, a really substantial program and has a, a wide breadth for from toddlers to, uh, to seniors. So in terms of the, the scope of what we're talking about, it's really impactful to people um, and their quality of life in the community. Um, the, the reductions that we've had to, uh, to deal with, we've tried to minimize the, the impact to the community, but we're getting to the point where it's, you know, it's, uh, it really is starting to show. By using reserves, which fortunately recreation has because mm -hmm. they've saved them up over several years, we're able to maintain current levels of service. But the amount of the general fund reduction and the amount of use of reserves is so significant that unless we find a solution to that, then once the reserves are gone, the, the reductions in service could be pretty significant. The other thing with recreation is that 65% um, of our budget comes through fees. And so if we had to, let's say, reduce staff or um, uh, basically cut positions is, is what you have to do if uh, it's kind of where we're at these days, then the revenue that those positions generate also goes away. So it's almost like for every general fund dollar that we use to fund a staff position, they're producing $2 in fees. And so if you had to reduce that position, you actually lose a lot more service. You know? so, so it gets pretty pretty difficult at that stage. And we've been able to avoid that up till now because we have, we have a good amount of reserves that we were able to build up, um, but those will be gone pretty soon. And I think that's a good point that uh, for our parks maintenance and our, our parks programs, those are um, pretty much wholly supported by our general fund. And as Marty pointed out, with recreation, um, a lot of the programs are supported by the fees uh, that, that folks pay for those programs. So while it's a little different and recreation does have some savings, uh, that's not the case with uh, parks. So let's talk a little bit about that parks piece as well. Um, you know, you mentioned certainly that the budget has been reduced, um, and some of that has maybe had some impacts or has had some impacts, and some of that we've been able to make some changes and, and have some really efficient practices to help us again minimize that negative impact to the public. Leanne, I'm going to ask you to talk just a little bit um, from the, you know, person who's out there in the parks and managing um, our crews that are taking care of the parks. 
what changes have occurred and what are some of those best practices that you all have put in place to try and minimize the negative impact? Well, some of the things that we're seeing out there is we don't have as many people working with us um, hourly is usually um, year round mm -hmm. and so we've had to make some changes in our snow removal. Uh, this last year we had to um, take in some other divisions to help us out. Golf and forestry and cemeteries helped us out with snow removal this year instead of having hourlies year round. Um, so that was um, quite an adjustment but um, we made it all work and still we're able to keep up that level of service. Mm -hmm. But another thing we see this time of year, since we don't have as many people working, um, we still have to cover weekends, tournaments for example, and um, big large events in our parks. And people have to take off during the week. So it takes out work that we're doing during the week. It takes time and, and mm -hmm. things that we should be getting done during the week we're not able to get to because we have to let those people go home in order to be here for the weekend. So um, we're not paying them overtime. So it does make, it's starting to show a little bit. There's things that we don't get to during the week that we would like to. Like um, a lot of times we're not uh, trimming behind the uh, mowers on mm -hmm. a timely, you know, on the same day or the next day after they are. Sometimes it's two, three days. Maybe we would, don't even get a park done and, uh, on a weekly basis anymore. So The participation level often drives the level of maintenance that Leanne and her crews and all the crew chiefs have to deal with. So the more people that are in the park, the more there is to take care of and to maintain and to, and to deal with. And, and the use of the park system is more popular than ever. You know, I think with the tougher economic times, people are staying closer to home. You know, we have a great park and trail system. Uh, these guys take a great deal of pride in, in keeping that level of maintenance uh, to the high standards that we've had over the years. But we're getting to the point now where, as Leanne's describing, we can't, we can't meet that expectation that we've basically set by doing a really good job, in my opinion, over the years. And, and now the resources are constrained and the use is up. And, you know, we're basically we're falling behind a little bit. So. So when we talk about parks, we've got both our community parks and also neighborhood parks. Are you talking about the entire system? And how do you prioritize as we start looking at changes in service? How do we make those decisions about you know, where we'll maybe mow less frequently? Tell us how it works. One thing we've done, and Leanne can help with this as well, but um, we've been trying to make the, the reductions um, the least impactful to the citizens as we can. One way to do that is you just defer a lot of maintenance. And so, uh, for example, Fossil Creek Community Park and Spring Canyon Community Park, two large new parks in the south part of town, we don't have any budget for repair and renovation for those parks. Now we can get by with that right now because we don't have, you know, we have relatively new parks. And so um, basic maintenance we can fund, but as those parks start to get older, we don't really have a funding source to keep them up like we would normally and that that level of funding has been reduced across the entire park system and so there's just a lot less money to keep things that break or need to be renovated we we just don't have much money to do that and i'm sure leanne's got, and she deals I with that every day a yeah. pretty good example of that um say for instance uh we have a vandalism on a slide in a playground and it's uh, broken and we have to remove it Typically, we would order a new slide, get that coming right away, but a lot of times now we just have to put a barrier across that, uh, that deck and we w we're not able to order the slide and get it replaced. So some little pieces like that are starting to go away and not be able to be replaced. And that impacts, you know, the experience for the people that come to, to use our parks. And as you pointed out, Marty, that uh, um, particularly, particularly in these uh, difficult economic times, people have um, they've stayed home for staycations and used our, our parks uh, more. And so we really want to have the equipment and we want to have the experience, uh, you know, for that. But it's getting a little more difficult um, uh, as we as you pointed out. Yeah. Some well, other things we've had to look at. Oh, sorry, Kelly. Um, 
just the overlay and the, and the maintenance of all of our tennis courts and parking lots and basketball courts. We have a lot of courts in mm -hmm. our parks and uh, most of them are in asphalt and that deteriorates over time and it needs quite a bit of maintenance and, and uh, attention and that budget we've had to cut pretty dramatically. So the quality of play on the courts is starting to, to diminish and then over time that'll actually um, up the price of, of caring for those areas because they're going to deteriorate if we can't keep them up to a certain level. So those are the sorts of things that are happening and someone might go out to a park and not really notice it a whole lot. Maybe the ball doesn't hit you know, quite as cleanly and, and there might be some impact there, but the day's coming when that's going to be a major problem for us. And those are the things that we're, that we're just struggling with right now. Yeah. One of the things that strikes me as I'm listening to, to all of you is that I think a lot of times with, with parks in particular, when we think O&M, we think mowing, picking up, you know, the trash and keeping restrooms clean, that sort of thing. But there's also a big infrastructure piece to parks that people may not think about, the courts, the playground equipment. And so from a safety perspective and, again, a usability perspective, we need to think about the infrastructure, not, not just the day-to-day -day maintenance pieces. Right. And if we had additional funding, there's some major projects that we'd like to take on that actually would save money and have a good environmental impact. So an example of that would be at Lee Martinez Park, where we irrigate that park. It's a, it's a community park on the north end of town, uh, about 65 acres, I think. But we have to irrigate it with treated water, which is not a good practice, because when that park was built, we didn't have a raw water irrigation system. So one thing we'd like to do, if, if we had a little extra money, would be to convert that to a raw water irrigation system, and then that saves us money in paying for treated water, and it's just much more environmentally um, sustainable. So it's those sorts of things we just can't get to right now. Right. Let's talk about some of those sustainability practices and, again, some of those things that we have done to be more efficient. I mean, it's not just saying, hey, you know, we want more money and we can do great things. I mean, that's part of it. But it's also that we've demonstrated that we're efficient with the resources we have. And so let's talk about some of those, those things we've done. Well, one of the things that we have done is um, converted some of our irrigation systems to raw water. Um, we have about three systems that we changed over from um, treated water to raw water, so that, that's a huge savings in treated water. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things we've done. Um, we have to, we're talking about fuel savings all the time and driving less miles. Um, so now we have four uh, maintenance shops where we used to just have one and drive out from that shop all over town. So we, now we have four located around town and we're always carpooling trying to plan trips if somebody's going to one shop you know we make sure that you pick up what needs to be picked up over there and take what needs to be taken over there so that we mm -hmm. we're talk constantly talking about that kind of stuff um, we're using a lot more volunteers to get projects done especially like we don't really have time to do projects anymore or the resources, so volunteers are a huge asset. And there's quite a few um, big days, volunteer days that we have every year that we use. And then we've got um, Eagle Scouts, mm -hmm. and we also have some Girl Scout and Boy Scout troops that volunteer, and a lot of people just from the public yeah. who care about their parks and want to help. Yep. That's great. I think last year we also had. Um, a group of young people in um, that uh, were at CSU, and uh, we partnered with CSU uh, to um, identify some projects, I think, in our park system. And so they were here for a few weeks, and they did some projects. And so that was another way in which we've used the uh, volunteers and people who are, you know, willing to donate their time and, and some of their expertise. You know, on that volunteer <laughs> issue, I, a lot of times we'll hear some, from folks to say, can't you just maintain a lot of your parks with volunteers? And we have Adopt-a-Park, Adopt-a-Trail programs that, that we do utilize. And, and as Leanne and Diane described, we, we use volunteers you know, in quite a significant way. But you can't just rely on volunteers to basically do park maintenance because well, a lot of it's heavy equipment, a lot of it's you know, somewhat dangerous. And um, volunteers aren't trained. You know, you have to have trained staff. A lot of what Leanne and the crew chiefs will do every season when we bring on our seasonal staff, we hope to get back um, people that we've trained in the past. But there's always a lot of new faces, and there's a lot of training that goes on just to make sure people know what they're doing, that they can be efficient, they know the equipment, and they know how to be safe when they're um, working out in the parks. And, um, and some of the work is really pretty highly technical. 
mean, a lot of the pumping systems, the irrigation systems, I mean, it's, there's a lot more to it, I think, than most people realize. So I'm just curious, how, how much of your staff in general is full-time year-round staff, and how much, uh, you know, what percentage are seasonal or hourly that we bring in, depending on the time of year? I think the full-time full staff over in parks, I think, is about like 38 full-time equivalents. Uh -huh. And then the hourly... Run around 90 in the, in the peak of the summer. Yeah, but okay. it fluctuates a lot, so... Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. That's actually similar for recreation as well. I would well. say and recreation would have the same thing. Yeah, recreation's got about 36 full-time, about 100 uh, hourly equivalents, but unlike parks where the seasonal staff will be on pretty much full-time during the season, with recreation you'll have, you know, coaches and referees mm -hmm. and lifeguards and people just working a few hours a week, teaching classes, all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a lot of people that are impacted or, or help recreation to be successful. Um, but the equivalent of all the people together is about 100 FT, but I bet it's over 1,000 actual people. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I hear that this summer the fountains are going to be turned off in a couple of the parks, the, the play features. Is that true? So far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, how do we make those choices, right? How do we make those determinations? The, the situation, just so everybody knows, it's not like we want to do this, it's not like anybody wants to do it, okay. but the um, projection for the 2010 budget, because of sales tax revenues coming in pretty weakly in the first few months of the year, um, it's just prudent that the budget office says, hey, it looks like we're not going to have as much money as we thought we were going to have, and so we have to make some cuts. They were projecting up to 1.2 million uh, shortfall for, for this year. And, and they determined that after the first few months came in so weakly. So it's not like anybody missed anything. It's just that those revenues just aren't there. Times are tough. And so we have to react to that. And um, we were asked in, in my service unit to come up with a, you know, quite a few ideas for saving money. And um, one of the ideas was to not turn the water on in, those, in the water feature at Fossil Creek Park and at Spring Canyon Park. Uh, it saves us about ten thousand dollars at each park, and there's a lot that the people probably don't realize it, but there's a lot of maintenance in uh, the water, and then the treatment of the water, and the monitoring, and the pumps, and and all that. Le Leanne can speak that better than I, but um, that's uh, you know it's quite a bit of savings, and we don't like to do it, but um, that's where we're at right now. So, and it's really about the the trade-offs um, when we're having to look at uh, reductions. Um, again, we're trying to um, minimize the impact to citizens as much as possible. So we look at ways in which, you know, to keep the, the fields well manicured or uh, the park experience. And, you know, it's just a matter of trade-offs thinking that this is, um, we don't like to do it as Marty pointed out, but uh, rather do that than, uh, than something else that really impacts more people uh, and their experience. Yeah, as a point of reference to that, the other uh, cut that I had to offer up was to close the restrooms in the parks and put in porta potties, uh, just because it saves so much on cleaning. But the level of service goes down significantly. But that cut wasn't accepted. So instead, you know, we're doing some of these other things. Yeah, and I think again that speaks to we're not um, looking for things that are going to um, impact the citizens, but we're at that point where you've cut out the other areas. Um, and stretched kind of as far as you can stretch is what I'm hearing. Right. The so other let, thing that I, I, that I wanted to mention is that, you know, we have a wonderful park system and people use it. And we also, as we look out uh, in future years, we have more neighborhood parks that we um, plan to, to build and uh, at least one other community park, I think. Um, and so it's also a, trying to balance of um, people that have paid in their impact fees uh, for the, the development of those neighborhood parks, which we, we want to. In our community, we try to, to provide a park uh, in every square mile, a neighborhood park. And so it's, it's a challenge then to figure out how do we bring those online for the people in those neighborhoods and then have the, the resources to maintain them. Yeah, if I could speak mm -hmm. to that as well, it's a really good point. But part of the, the funding that um, if we got additional funding, we would restore maintenance level reductions so that we can keep the existing park system in good shape. 
we'd have um, some money for life cycle and environmental and sustainability projects. But more significantly, even, life cycle, uh, maintenance and reno uh, re repair and renovation. Okay. Sorry, that's our little internal <laughs> term for that. I just had to ask. Yeah. But the, the other thing that the funding would be used for would be to maintain new parks that are coming on. So as Diane was talking about the impact fee, when new residential construction takes place, the one-time fee is paid so that a park is built near that home. A uh, community park within a four square mile, uh, serves a four square mile area, neighborhood parks uh, a square mile area. So if we had additional funding, we think that um, we basically have 20 years worth of growth left in the city. And um, at the million dollar level that we've requested, a lot of that goes uh, just to bring the existing park system uh, up to traditional standards of maintenance, but then enough money would be available to maintain seven new parks um, indefinitely, uh, and that would allow those parks to be built. And so what we don't want to have happen is for the community to grow and new parts of town not have a park system or a park nearby because it just makes the, the park system unequal, and then it'll fill up the rest of the parks as well. So we need to find some way to maintain um, these new parks as they come on and you know frankly we brought on uh, Spring Canyon Park 100 acre park without additional general fund money we took conservation trust money away from trail construction that comes from the lottery uh, and then we just um, eliminated positions and then repositioned staff and um, and to deal with some of these budget reductions and um, and that that's why that park doesn't have a um, long-term maintenance um, budget and we're basically um, doing it um, you know, with pretty much existing resources. So uh, those are the things we've done to try to keep things together. But frankly, we're at that point where that's, that's not going to work anymore. Right. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit because I want to also spend a little more time talking about recreation. Um, at the beginning of the program, Marty, you talked about um, we're using reserves, which basically means some temporary short-term dollars, um, but those are going to go away. Talk a little bit about um, if we continue to use reserves at the level we're using them now, how long they'll last, and what kind of choices we would be facing uh, once those go away. The, yeah, the, the situation now is for this budget cycle in 2010, we're using reserves at about the $750,000 level to maintain services. So there was a $1.1 million reduction in general fund support. So that means in recreation that our general fund support went from about $2.5 million to about $1.4, $1.5. Um, that's a huge <coughs> uh, re reduction. But when you have the reserves, it helps to make it up. The difference between the 750 and the 1.1 that we were cut, we, we laid off staff. We, re, we eliminated two positions and we raised fees and, um, and then we have a couple of vacancies that we haven't filled. So that's how we made up the difference. Um, and, and so it impacts services, but um, we haven't had to close a major facility, anything like that. It's because of those reserves. Next year we're scheduled to use those reserves at the $900,000 level. And that would be based partly on bringing uh, on board a recreation uh, director. Uh, our director retired a um, year and a half ago, and we haven't filled that position. Um, and so we probably won't fill it um, uh, under the current circumstances. But you know, if times look better, um, you know, we, we would use the reserves at that level. But we at least have to use them at about the $800,000 level. And so um, they're out. Basically, we're done in uh, early 2013. So I think that um, it's kind of a double whammy. We, uh, our general fund resources from sales and use taxes for general fund, um, that those um, have not kept pace. And as Marty talked about earlier, what we had expected for this year has not, um, um, we're not seeing the resources come in and the revenues come in as strongly. So when the general fund revenues are reduced and then we use our savings, to, to cover that and our savings are going away, then we have both of those resources begin to diminish. So at some point, as Marty points out, something has to give. And if there are no resources, then we'll have to do um, major cuts. One of the questions I hear is, well, what about increasing fees? If you look at something like the recreation centers, you know, could you just charge people more to use them? Right. Yeah, I can address that. We've we've been working on that for several years now. That's why we've moved our um, ability to support uh, the recreation operation from about a 52% level up to a 66% level presently. Part of that's being more efficient. Um, we've lost positions, but 
we have um, increased our fee revenue. And recreation uh, does a really good job of offering great programs and participation levels are really high. I think we had 1.4 million participations last year. So lots of use. There's a tension between access to recreation and all the benefits it provides to the community and the price that you charge. Because we have seen in several areas, actually, that we hit our price point, is the way I talk about it, where participation drops off because people don't want to pay that much. And then that's counterproductive because you lose the revenue. If people aren't participating at high levels, even if you're getting more per person, you're not getting more overall because you're not, you don't have enough people participating. So, you, so it's like selling anything. You have to make sure you don't exceed your price point. So we look at that and we try to, to do the best we can. There's a f you know, few areas where we might be able to, again, look at, at raising fees. I'm talking to the staff about that right now. Um, but frankly, it's, um, it's, it's not the kind of service that, um, that we can expect to be self-supporting. Otherwise, it's basically a health club, you know, and that's not the purpose. Right. So. All right. Well, um, we've talked a lot about the needs that are out there and, and looking forward. Um, I also want to spend just the last couple minutes talking about what it is you think we're doing really well. And as you think about how we've kind of weathered the storm so far, what are you most proud of? Um, and what do you think we're doing best? Well, I think that um, for Leanne and um, uh, her colleagues and the crews that she works with, I think that they've done an incredible job of trying to look at how to be more efficient. They, they look at uh, um, best practices, so how we can make those, the dollars and the resources go further, again, to really minimize the impact to citizens, because that's what we're about. We're about providing the best service, the best facilities that we can, because we know people love them and use them, so, so that's what we try to do. But I think that uh, I'm, I'm really proud of the efficiencies and, uh, and the commitment that people have to do that. The, our, uh, our uh, staff and employees just, you know, they do such a, a good job uh, at that. So I think that's uh, one of the things I'm really proud of the work that they do. Great, thank you. Marty? That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it's true. I mean, that, that's what it's kind of all about these days is, is the fact that we have, that's what makes it so hard is because the staff is so committed and has been. I mean, they devote their careers to making our parks better, providing great recreational services to the community and they have a passion about it and it and to see that diminish because of the resource issue I think we're all struggling with that but the the thing that's gratifying for me is that everybody's just doing the best they can under the circumstance every day and and you know that's what keeps it together so we're all, I think we're all working hard to um, do more with less and um, everybody just loves being in parks so much I think we're all I, we all just love our job so mm -hmm. it makes it um, a little easier to just try to keep doing what we are doing and be efficient at it okay, great mm -hmm. well thank you all for joining us it's been very helpful to get some additional information about what's going on in parks and recreation um, for those of you who would like further information please go to fcgov.com resourcing our future Thanks for joining us.